Arrow bonus episode. We're on the road to Deadpool and Wolverine talking about X-Men Days of Future Past today, uh, which means we're going to do a review and we're going to talk about the movie and all the details that you may have missed with your own eyeballs. I'm Brandon Davis, joined today by Aaron Perrine. What's going on, BD? Shout out to Brendan for watching from work. We will not tell your boss. No. Where we do you work? Snitch. Where do you work, Where Brendan? Do you work? <laughs> we got Jenna Anderson. Hey, everybody. And hello to Jack, who is supposedly listening live for the very first time. We're happy to have you yeah. here. What's up, Jack? Hello, Jamie. Hello. And hey to Patrick. He just said afternoon, but I wanted to also shout somebody out in the comments. <laughs> Jeez, I need. To, I gotta pick somebody. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> welcome to the show. This is X Men: Days of Future Past. What did we? What was our last Monday? Was first class last week? Yes or no? The Wolverine. The Wolverine yeah. was last week. We've That's already right. done the Wolverine X Men First Class. Today is X Men: Days of Future Past. As every Monday, we are reviewing and recapping the X Men movies made by Fox to get ready for Deadpool and Wolverine. Today it's X Men: Days of Future Past. Next week it's Deadpool One. Deadpool 1. Have you guys seen that movie? A couple times. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I've heard of it. Uh, this is my first time watching X-Men Days of Future Past. So, <laughs> so April Fool's on that one. I will say this is my first time watching X-Men Days of Future Past having seen X-Men First Class, which only makes this movie even better. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why you guys didn't tell me about that first class movie. <laughs> we told you constantly <laughs> all the time and you did not listen. <laughs> all right. So X-Men Days of Future Past. This is how the episodes go. We're going to start with Jamie's recap. Then we're going to give you our reactions as if a social media embargo lifted. Unfortunately, none of us were doing this job for comicbook.com back when this movie released. So this is our first time to talk about it that way. Then we're going to take a quick break. And during the break, you're going to subscribe to the Phase Zero channel and share it with a friend. When we come back, we're going to do a deep dive into everything about X-Men Days of Future Past, kind of all the interesting story points, everything we want to talk about from the film as if the movie just released and we're talking about it for the first time. And then one more break, another opportunity to subscribe if you didn't follow the directions and subscribe the first time. And then we're going to give it a review score out of 10 and we will give you a review of 10 out of 10 if you subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for that. Now, without further ado, it's everybody's favorite part of the show. We got it. We, we maybe should start saving this for last because I think the room probably clears out once Jamie finishes because it is the highlight for everyone. But Aaron, go ahead. Put those five minutes on the clock. It is time for Jamie Jurax X-Men Days of Future Past recap. All right, it's New York City. It's sometime in the future. Kitty and Bobby, they're back, baby, and they got a whole lot of new friends, and they're fighting Sentinels. The world has been destroyed. What's going on? How is this happening? It's because uh, this guy named Trask back in the 70s invented this giant machine and was like, we're going to kill all the mutants, but then they started to form, and they decided to kill humans that also were going to one day have babies that were mutants, and then all of a sudden the world is destroyed, and they're like, we need help. They're fighting the Sentinels, but they're doing a really good job. They have this plan where they do things, and they go back in time, and it's working, but it's not going to work for much longer and then people come to visit who is it it's professor x it's storm it's logan whoa the team's back together or the ones that are alive are back together anyway oh my god maybe is there too everyone's friends and they're like we've got a plan kitty you've been using flowers to send people back in time but what we're gonna do is we're gonna send wolverine back to the 1970s using his brain into his old body and in doing that he is going to stop mystique from killing trask which was the catalyst of this great war can you do it and he says let's do it and he get and he goes but here's the thing you gotta get me Charles Charles and Eric together, but they were not friends. They were having a hard time. They were going through it in the 1970s, but he's like, okay, let's go. So he gets in, he wakes up in his body in the 1970s. The first time I ever saw your face. And he's like, where am I? Oh my gosh. Lava lamps, 1970s, hot girl in the bed with me. The drama's already beginning. And then he's like, boom, boom, getting out of there. And he's like, oh, my claws aren't metal. How am I going to beat people up with them? And then he's like, all right, here I go. I'm going to go find Charles. Boom, 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 boom. He goes to the mansion and mm -hmm. then uh, the there is Hank. Hank opens the door and he's like, oh, you're Beast? You look like a little baby. You are blue and you don't look like Kelsey Grammer, but I know you. And he's like, I need the professor. There's no professor here. I need to talk to the professor. There's no professor here. That whole rigmarole goes on. And then they meet Charles. Charles is there and he can walk, but he doesn't have powers. He's depressed. He's drinking. He says, I can't help you. And he goes, but you must. You know who sent me back into the time? It's you and Eric, your friends. We need you. And he's like, oh, okay. Let's, but you know where Eric is? No, I don't. He's in the Pentagon because, uh oh, what did he do? He supposedly killed the president let's find out so like how are we gonna get into the pentagon actually i know a guy he'd be kind of young let's go to his house and they go to his house and it says maximoff in the mailbox oh my god look who it is it's quicksilver and he's like hi 
boy, I'm really fast and I'm going to help you. And they're like, let's go. So they go to the Pentagon and he get, they get Eric out of there and they're like, here's the thing. Mind the glass. Boom, boom, boom. And he's like, I'm going to grab your neck. And he's like, why are you doing that? So you don't get whiplash. Let's go. And they're about to escape. And Eric punches Charles and he's like, oh, I'm so mad at you. And he goes, oh, I'm so mad at you too. And then all these guys hold guns on them. And, Mag and Magneto's like, Charles, aren't you going to use your powers? And he's like, I can't use my powers. And then they're like, what are we going to do? And Magneto starts to do his mad, uh, metal things. But then all of a sudden, Quicksilver's like, don't worry, I got this. And then it's like, if I say I'm in a bottle. And then they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he's going around and it's so cool. And he speeds up and he does everything and it's whoosh. They're all down. And they're like, whoa, that was really cool. Let's get out of here. And now they're like, bye, Quicksilver. It was really nice meeting you. See you later. And maybe in a different franchise. And then they're like, all right, let's get on a plane. We're going to Paris. We're going to stop Mystique because they're in Paris because it's all the aftermath of the Vietnam War and they're doing this peace treaty stuff. And they're like, all right, we're on the plane. And Charles is like, you abandoned me. And Eric is like, you abandoned all of us. And then he makes the plane shake. And they're like, oh, we're such friends, but we hate each other. And then Wolverine was like, you were always an asshole. And then Eric and Charles are like, let's play some chess. Maybe that'll make us be friends again. And then they're like, all right, cool. And then they get to where they're going. And Mystique, she's ready. She's going to kill Trask. But then... Everyone tries to come in and stop her, and they're like, Mystique, no, you can't do it. And then Eric, he tries to kill Mystique, because he's like, I'm sorry, but your blood is the one that's going to turn all this war, and you're going to hurt us, so I'm going to kill you. And she's like, but Eric, why? We were together, and we're friends. And then, but he doesn't get her. He shoots her in the leg, but he doesn't get her. And they're like, oh, God, Eric, what are you doing? Uh, so then they're like, all right, next phase of this plan. And Charles is like, this is too hard. I can't do it. You've come to the wrong person. And so, so Wolverine He's like, no, get into my mind and see. And then Charles, talk to Charles. And he's like, Charles, you're Charles, and you can Charles your way out of this. You can do it, I promise. And then he gets his he gets his motivation. And he's like, all right. Meanwhile, in the future, Wolverine had a little freak out because guess who he saw in the past? Striker, young Striker. And they're like, oh, remember when he's there turning to Brian Cox? And then he accidentally slashes Kitty. And now she's really hurting. She's like, I gotta hold on, but it hurts so bad. But that's okay. They're working on it. Back into the past. It's uh, 4th of July. Biz, or maybe something big business going down. I don't know. Some kind of an American parade. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, we're going to go after the president. It looks like Nixon. I think it's Nixon. And then they're in this bunker. And they're like, oh, no. But then Magneto comes and he takes the bunker out because no one is safe because it was a metal bunker. And all of a sudden, he's like, he's going to kill Trask and he's going to kill everybody. And then, then Mystique comes and she's like, no. And then she saves the president. And Charles gets in her head and he's like, it's not too late. You can stop this all. And she's like, oh, I don't know. They hate us. She's like, no, 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 do it. And she listens to him and she saves everybody and she doesn't kill Trask and everything works out and they're like yay but oh no Magneto does get Wolverine and puts him into the bottom of the water that's crazy oh no what's gonna happen but it's okay because the day was saved then Logan wakes up the first time I'm gonna saw your face and it's a different present day he's back in the school oh my god everyone's there it's Kelsey Grammer it's Jean it's Scott and he's like professor I'm here. And he goes, yeah, you're here. What do you mean? He's like, I mean, I'm really here. And he goes, oh, you have a lot to catch up on. Days of Future Past. Woo. Woo, woo, woo. A little over. It's a long movie. We won't penalize you because that so had much so to much cover. enthusiasm. No penalty. No <laughs> you penalty. didn't even cover the post credit scene. So I, I totally get it. There's oh, so oh much God. going on. Sorry. Yeah. Well, oh, neither did the Fox franchise. Yeah. If that, you know. Uh, so, all right, that's X Men: Days of Future Past. Now we're gonna go around with reactions, as if the social media embargo just lifted. You just watched the movie for the first time, Aaron Perrine. What are you gonna tweet <laughs> about it? Oh my goodness. Um, so I I really really enjoy the confidence this movie has. I feel like this movie and probably X Two and maybe First Class are the only movies that have like the full confidence that we know exactly what we're doing. We know these characters. We know exactly what's going on. And to be able to barrel forward in that confidence is the movie's greatest strength. Because you're not afraid of how silly it is that our pasts can affect our futures or our futures become our past or whatever Mark Ruffalo said. You're not worried about stuff not matching up with metal claws or no metal claws or whatever. You're just telling the story that you want to tell. And I really really enjoy that aspect of this more than anything else. Jenna, Jenna what do you think? 
I, I like this movie a lot. I, I definitely, I said this in our first class episode, but I almost mourn the proper first class sequel that we probably could have and should have gotten before we got to this point, because especially rewatching this movie and hearing all of the, the things that they talk about having happened in the past decade, I'm like, I want to see that. I wish we could have seen that before we got to this massive crossover uniting the two timelines. But I think for the time and for what they had, like Aaron said, they were so confident and just threw so much at the wall and I can't help but admire it. I uh, have no problem with not getting the first class sequel that you mentioned because a, I hadn't seen first class until like a week ago, but all, and I, I loved it, but also B, this is my favorite X-Men movie. I think this movie is tremendous. I think it is so smart. Even if it's time travel rules aren't perfect, that's okay. I'm still, I'm, I'm a Marvel fan at the end of the day. And I accept that time travel rules ain't going to be perfect. No matter what kind of ensemble film you're doing. Uh, I think that this is a better Age of Ultron adaptation than Avengers Age of Ultron. Uh, but it's uh, it, it just has that. I mean, the characters are great. This this kind of right from that opening scene where like Bobby is on the ice and he looks at Kitty and you're like, oh, wow, they, they give each other kind of a glance. Uh, it's like, wow, there's great relationships deep seated in all of these characters. And that's what I loved about this franchise from the beginning. In addition to just the great individual characters and their powers and everything that the, the, fa the threats they're facing. Uh, but I just think this movie was tremendous and so well done. And the merging of the casts, it was kind of fast looking back at all of this, but it was, it was, I, I, I don't know how they could have done it better. I loved it. Jamie, what'd you think? I love this movie very much. Uh, hmm. I will say though, this is the last time anybody makes me watch the theatrical cut again. Uh, <laughs> I, I hadn't seen the theatrical cut in, in 10 years. And I obviously like I knew the rogue stuff wasn't in there, but I forgot what else wasn't in there. And I was pissed watching this. Like oh, some of my favorite moments weren't in this movie. And I was, I'm like, so uh, rogue cut. I recommend we're, I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk more about the road cut later. So I won't get into those details now. Um, I do agree though, that I wish another movie had come before this. Although I wish that it had been more with some of our older characters, uh, especially because uh, I wish that we had earned a little closer to what's going on in this scary future. Uh, like get to know blink and Bishop and all this stuff. I, mm. I, I wish that we had a little bridge cause I don't know if they quite earned this crossover, but it's still an amazing crossover. I call this my comfort cast movie. It's just so fun to see everybody in it. It's, it's a great movie. It's a, it, it's uh and I mean that Quicksilver scene, I think is one of the best scenes in any comic book movie ever. So. Mm -hmm. I just tweeted that this is, I tweeted the best X-Men movie while quoting phase zero to try to drive people to our live show. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean that I think this is the best X-Men movie, but somebody replied and said X2 is the best because of the night crawler opening scene. Uh, the, what the, I think one of the only scenes that can be compared to that quality is the Quicksilver scene you just mentioned. It's so mm -hmm. good. Yeah. If I could sing this song any longer, we'd get a trademark <laughs> takedown. Uh, but you get what I'm saying. So, yeah, this movie has everything. Tremendous action, tremendous characters, tremendous stakes. All well done. And mostly mostly very, very good visual effects. I mean, the Sentinels, everything looks great. The only scene that kind of looked kind of cheapish on the VFX front was when Magneto put the uh, metal bars into the Sentinel on the train. When you mm -hmm. saw the Sentinel there, it was very clearly computerized. But the rest of it I thought was brilliant. And the the, the use of the powers, in the, like, like Blink's powers, oh, so, so damn good. So well done. Um, Quick facts about this movie before we take our break here. Uh, directed by Brian Singer, written by Simon Kinberg, Matthew Vaughn, who did First Class, and Jane Goldman. Uh, it made $746 million on a $205 million budget. It is the number one X-Men movie at the box office. Number three Fox Marvel movie because the only two movies ahead of it are Deadpool and Deadpool 2. Uh, so it was quite a successful movie. I remember this movie coming out. This was like a big moment. There were huge posters. It had all of the X-Men on these posters. It just looked so good. The poster was like, I mean, I still have the physical, like th this poster in giant size was so cool. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that, that's, that's a good movie. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We come back, we're going to do our deep dive into the film, talk about all kinds of stuff. If you have stuff you want to talk about and you're watching live with us, drop it in the comment section. We'll talk about the Rogue Cut. We'll talk about some of the Easter eggs and all that stuff. You know the drill. So subscribe to the channel, share our show with your friends, and uh, we'll see you in just a moment.
Welcome back to Phase Zero's X-Men Days of Future Past, Road to Deadpool and Wolverine review bonus episode. We're going to start at the beginning. We might get off course. You know us. We like to yap a bit. Uh, so the, the, we, we, talk, we start each one of these, it seems, with the opening scenes. And this has, again, a tremendous opening scene for these X-Men movies. And I remember Marvel Studios started doing like a villain origin, basically, as their opening scene for so many movies. And that was already well in, in play by this because this was 2014. They were six years into the MCU. And it felt like almost every Marvel movie would start with like a villain scene, credits, and then like a fun check-in with the hero. And these X-Men movies would start with these really heavy sort of gritty bits to tell you what kind of movie you're going to watch. And this isn't necessarily some happy-go-lucky superhero flick. And this was no different. The Sentinels are washing the X-Men. I mean, wiping them off the, the, off the map. Um, and that was reminiscent of those the weight that those other X-Men movies started with. And it also starts with the mutants in Central Park being kind of thrown into a, uh, ter- like a, a, what kind of, I don't know, was that some sort of mutant concentration camp at mm-hmm. Central Park? And they all have the M kind of branded it, burnt into their their face, which Bishop has, of course. And it kind of, like those subtle moments add a really heavy depth to some of the sm- other details when you catch them and think about them in these X-Men movies. That opening is like one of my favorite parts of the entire movie because that is not only very comic accurate, but it does like set the tone in such a big way. I I definitely agree with Jamie that I feel like they there's a lot of leaps taken to get to the point of this very dark future. But I think that moment says a lot very quickly with saying very little at the same time. Yeah. So as someone who recently watched the live action adaptation of Avatar Last Airbender, sometimes you don't probably need to show all of the carnage on screen for us to understand like that is very harrowing circumstances. I also feel like it's a really clever way to call back to getting those two Magneto openings, which are by far the most effective openings of these movies, like period. So Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I'm sitting there. I, that's what I said. I'm like, from the word go, they're like, we know what we're doing. We know exactly where this is coming from. You're already getting the comics nods with the stuff like the brand on their faces and stuff. Uh, so it sets the bar pretty high. And we never really alter from that. I uh, I mentioned already like the subtleties of the moments like uh, Bobby and Kitty seeing each other that for like as a longtime fan who watched, you know, the first three X-Men movies, you're like, oh, wow, they, you know, they kind of had a relationship. That's fun to see. Uh brought back uh but then there's also one of my favorite things about that sequence is blink's powers i thought that was so well directed and created and visually represented and executed the way that she's like sending colossus through the portals and then the sentinels through the portals and all that and then like you could kind of see through one portal which then shoots the camera would then have to shoot into a different room for like that one little but i thought that was such a masterful cool way of doing that i don't i can't think of anything 10 years ago that had done anything like that yet and that really to me was what someone on the production team really loved portal somebody (laughs) on the production team loved our bachelor drop that's i had to go back and look and see if that game it came before it predates it by like seven years so i'm like yeah somebody was just like play the heck out of portal portal 2 come back and talk to us when it when you figure it out right I do have to say with the the Bobby and Kitty moment, I do love how now with the Umbrella Academy out and Elliot Page's character has a very similar sort of moment with one of their siblings on the show. So I love how there's just this like cinematic universe of their characters kind of having this weird run in as they're walking in separate directions with people. Um, That made me laugh, even though, like you said, there's such a significance to the moment. But yeah, I agree. Blink's powers, top notch. Uh, Then we go to uh, the military. Raven is in the military now. Got a little squad going. Toad, Havoc. Uh, Havoc is back from First Class, which, you know, obviously everybody saw First Class now. So <laughs> you recognize that new kind of look on Toad a bit, more comics accurate. Uh, some other mutants in her squad. She also, by the end of that scene, is, has Biggs on her uh, uniform, which is an, uh, an alias from comics that she went by. Um, anything from that sequence that you guys... I had this in my notes. I ne- We need to talk about how wild it was that that was one of the post credit scenes for Amazing Spider-Man 2. Um, because I, I was like, I feel like I know this scene a lot more than like a lot of the other sequences in this movie. And it's because like I kept seeing it every single time I saw Amazing Spider-Man 2. And just the fact that these two studios were able to work with each other in that way at that time feels like especially wild considering where we're at now with everything. So... I'm I'm Googling this, but I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure that the reason why the Mystique scene was at the end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was because Sony owed Fox an ad 
Mm. And the like the way they paid it back was that was considered a piece of marketing. Uh, and they were obviously like they were never working together in terms of story or development. But I'm pretty sure this, as the story goes, they owed the other an ad. Uh, I'm looking it up right now. That is bizarre, just because yeah. I I didn't see the Amazing Spider-Man two in theaters, so mm -hmm. I didn't know this, and really? I can't imagine like yeah, I had no idea, and uh -huh. I feel like if I had seen that, I would have been like, what? <laughs> I would have I would have thought that they were crossing over. I uh -huh. mean, that just seems like a like what else would it maybe doing? I would have been confused and then angry if I had <laughs> been privy to this at the time. So this is and also. Help. Just but, given the events of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, it is also such a weird note to kind of end the viewing experience on. Yeah. Of like, hey, go see this other Marvel movie from this other studio that if you know the comics, this storyline is also very dark. Like, it was so bizarre at the time, and especially considering kind of the three camps of studios that were making Marvel movies at that point. Like, it was just so wild, and it feels even more wild in hindsight. This is what The Hollywood Reporter said on April 16th, 2014. Collaboration between Sony and Fox was actually primed by the presence of Amazing Spider-Man 2 director Mark Webb. Webb had an existing contract with Fox that he was allowed out of the helm out of to helm the Sony project on the understanding that the latter studio would assist in promotion of Fox's X-Men property, mm -hmm. essentially structuring the framework for this new partnership before either side had the idea of sharing a scene between movies. So, Mark Webb got out of a Fox movie and in order to do that Sony had to agree that they would promote a Fox movie in exchange. That's so that's funny. interesting. Hollywood wow. man, show business. It's weird. Making hey, deals. Chasing their money. Uh, Wolverine meeting Beast. I loved uh, Jamie talking about that. Oh, you're Hank. You're going to be Beast. There's a, yeah, you're young. You're different now. So that's kind of the introduction to the uh, mansion there. The young professor says Wolverine looks slightly familiar. And of course I know that's a reference to the fact they had a brief interaction at a bar in first class. <laughs> Obviously, I get that. Uh, what did you think before when you watched this? Because he quotes the, the line that Logan says in first class. He quotes it back to him. What did you think at the time before having seen first class? I, I'm pretty sure I had seen that see the, the cameo. Like I had mm -hmm. seen parts of first class before this movie came out, but I I had never seen the whole thing. Like I didn't I, I, I don't even know if I remember. I don't remember, but I don't know if I even knew that that was how Charles got uh, paralyzed from the waist down in these in this franchise. I don't remember that if I knew that or not. Um, but I did know that Wolverine had a cameo in that where they tried to recruit him and he didn't go. I like, I wasn't completely in the dark on first class. I had just never sat down to watch the whole thing all the way through. Uh, but now like watching this, like watching Wolverine show up there and talk to Charles and like seeing Charles kind of so disparaged and beaten down and like the feeling defeated, it made so much more sense. Like I was just like, Oh, okay. When I watched this, I thought for the first time 10 years ago, I thought like, Oh, well, this is just the version of Charles we're getting now. I didn't really understand. I thought it was just like the young Charles we're getting now. I knew he had been in a movie before, but I didn't know this was the effects of that. But it makes a lot more sense in context. Just like that scene on the, the plane, too. It makes a lot of sense. I'm really hung up on the fact that Days of Future Past can be your favorite X-Men movie without having you <laughs> seen First Class. Like, I, I, it's like Endgame's your favorite movie, but you've never yeah. seen Infinity War. Or like Empire like, Strikes <laughs> Back, but you yeah. haven't seen A New Hope. <laughs> I mean, I respect it because it is a good movie, and I and I like I that you were like, fun. yeah. But it is funny to me that you're like, this is my favorite. I don't have any context oh. for it. <laughs> and that just, listen, that just speaks to what a phenomenal film it is, okay? Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I just... This movie, I remember watching this in theaters and it was, I was just blown away by this movie and I still am. I watched it again this weekend and I think it's phenomenal. Uh, and I'm just also a sucker for time travel. This also uses time travel similar to that of Lost with the kind of consciousness transfer rather than physical transfer. Uh, and oh, well, Lost kind of does both, but uh, I, I really, I, I really adore this film. Um, then we get uh, Mystique finding out the dead mutant files, which includes first class characters. There's so many times first class in this movie. Who would have thought? Uh, <laughs> last joke I'll make about that. So that's kind of Mystique's turning point. Like, F it. I'm killing Trask. Like, this man is experimenting on my homies. I'm not I'm not for it. And that that then leads us to Quicksilver's intro, uh, where there's a, a reference to... Wait, what did I... Well, there's a reference to Wolverine knowing him when he was older. Oh, yeah. Wait a second. Did I forget something? Or was that just kind of a vague reference to something that happened in between the year of... Right, there was no Quicksilver Wolverine interaction before this. No, no. Okay. sadly, Chelsea sadly, Lee's no. Right. I, I think it was just to, to see. Yeah, what it was that just would to be. easy, like easily justify that they would know who he is. I think. Mm, maybe that'll pay off in Deadpool and Wolverine. Who knows? It's like they have a chance to do it. Quicksilver also says uh, 
they told me you control metal. You know, my mom once knew a guy who could do that. So, uh, hey, 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 I got some news for you, Quicksilver. That's your daddy. <laughs> Tumblr lost its mind over that line. Like, that was the only thing that was talked about for, like, a solid month. So I, I, I hold that scene to a very special place in my heart. The math isn't mathing for me, but that's no, not, not a, at all. Th that's the X-Men franchise as a whole, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Math is, is non-existent when it comes to time yeah. in this yeah. franchise. But, uh... So he saves his dad <laughs> with the Quicksilver scene. I thought the, the Quicksilver scene, I, I, I don't, I, there's not much to say about this other than it's fantastic, but I tried to like be clever and analyze this, you know, like new rock star style. And the only thing I noticed that I didn't notice before was that uh, the, there's like the footprints on the wall because he, he's running so fast. They, the details they put in included that when he was running along the wall, it was breaking into the wall with each step. And I was like, man, they really nailed this. The details are tremendous. And also it's the same sequence where Charles is lying to Eric about his powers and like saying, okay, fine, I won't use them. But really, bro, can't use them. So, hmm. And then Wolverine at the end is like, nice kid, pats him on the shoulder because Wolverine always has a soft spot for, you know, the kids basically. Even though he's like this tough guy, he's always down to like help people and build them up. Mm -mm -mm. What a masterful film. It's the details, guys. It's the details. <laughs> uh, Eric and Charles are arguing on the plane. Got to be one of Jamie's favorite scenes. <laughs> God, My I mean, friends sometimes fight, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Got to be one of Jamie's favorite scenes. If there is a Mount Rushmore of X-Men scenes for Jamie, I think all of them with Fassbender and McAvoy's Eric and Charles are, all four of them have the, the are scenes with both of them in it. Um, Eric says he was trying to save the president, not kill the president. And Charles is like, but the bullet curved. Mm. I thought this was like a brilliant scene because it, uh, like it's, it, it dumps exposition on us. It tells us everything we need to know about what has happened in the gap between, you know, the, the cube of missile crisis and all that from X-Men first class, which is a great movie. And it like reflects on their history. Their love of mystique is kind of added to it. And then it also reminds the audience what is at stake with Trask and the future and all the mutants in a way that's so satisfyingly de de delivered through dialogue in a sequence which could have otherwise been so cheesy exposition just to remind the audience, hey, you know, Trask is going to get Mystique's blood. He's going to create these Sentinels. It's going to create a terrible future. So we need to stop that before it happens. No, they really used all this as a moment to catch us up with everything. Use the relationship. Use the excellent individual characters to remind the audience what's at stake. And I thought this was one of the most impressive uses of, of exposition in, in any of these films. I totally agree. I also just am always a sucker for world building that mm -hmm. leans into stuff that is in the real world in some sort of way. Cause like I grew up in Dallas, Texas. So the, the circumstances of that whole thing are very familiar to me and just canonizing it through the context of Magneto trying to save the president because he's a mutant is just such a nice little touch. So the president would have survived like he would have missed if magneto didn't curve the bullet captain charles <laughs> mm, it's happened to charles <laughs> not magneto's first time no dodging a bullet into someone else that's an x-men first class reference because i love that movie <laughs> uh let's see what else we got here yo eric trying to shoot mystique this mm. This girl needs to stay away from him. He is a red flag for her, <laughs> but she keeps going back. He was in the future. He was going to leave her behind in the past. He was going to kill her. My goodness. When he, when er, that, that's that moment where Michael Fassbender sticks his hand out, the gun flips up into his hand and he's about to shoot mystique on the table. I was just like, dude, this dude is such a, uh, an incredible villain. I really love Jennifer Lawrence's performance in this sequence because yeah. first of all, she's acting through like all that blue. Right. But mm. like the, just like the pleading in her eyes and the confusion as to why Eric would be trying to kill her. Cause she doesn't understand and she doesn't know. And I really, really like the scene because mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, and then there's the added part of people are seeing mutants for the first time. And it's, it's, it's a really powerful moment of the movie. And it's the, you know, it's the kind of the big, the big up. And that's also, I mean, that, that sequence is kind of also a metaphor for what these X-Men movies are in general. It's like forcing somebody's coming out before they were comfortable with it. Like Beast is sitting there looking at everybody and he's just like, they're seeing me as this thing that I'm not comfortable with them seeing me as. And I thought that that sequence, like the, the Nicholas Holt performance there in that moment too, when he's stuck in the fountain 
was just great because you can feel the heartbreak because you know this character is trying to get used to being himself and then it's forced upon him in that really tough moment uh yeah no that was that was good that the, these movies these x-men they had some hits they had some good they had some good stuff in these we all we all realized. like to poo poo on the x-men movies because fox had some misses but there's some good stuff in here I, I just realized too, James McAvoy has a very, very long history of like bad moments with curved bullets. I ain't realized to literally just now. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's right. I thought of that too. Wanted, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. gosh. Oh, yeah. Cinema. Wanted. What a film. What a film. All um, of my friends thought it was the coolest thing in the world when it wanted? came out. We're all like, yo, this is dope. All of us. Little I nerds. was always thinking about that. I'd be with my Nerf gun, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it? That- T- BD, you know? there's so much overlap in another time. We, we all live the same lives. <laughs> we all live the same lives. I don't know. Did anyone else go see Wants It in Theaters with their economics teacher? <laughs> what? We all live the same wow. lives. Wow. A, she, she was just hanging out with everybody. She was like everybody's <laughs> friend. It was, it, in retrospect, very weird. But at the time, it was very normal. <laughs> Jamie, what? I do feel like nuggets. We all had a teacher like that, so I get it. It, But just like the specificity of that is so wild. Yeah, we all had those teachers who were a little too friendly. (laughs) Oh, that bro, he thinks he's on the team. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Drake. Uh, All right. Then, uh, all right. So next, Magneto gets that helmet back, which I thought, oh, wait, 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 wait. Back it up. Uh, Charles meets Charles. This is one of my favorite scenes in comic book movie history. And I'm going to be honest with you. I also gaslit myself into thinking it was longer and even more profound than it was because I I, like I watched it again. I was like, wow, it's much shorter and more abbreviated than I thought. But I still think it's one of the best sequences. So not only do I love the moment, which was in every trailer where Charles says to Logan, I don't want your suffering. I don't want your future. Uh, that's such a good piece of dialogue and such a well-performed moment by James McAvoy. But then when he, he meets himself and McAvoy meets Stuart in this sort of future past crossover uh, and uh, Charles, you know, the, just because someone stumbles, loses their way, doesn't mean they're lost forever. Come on. This whole sequence, the performance, the dialogue, all of it is an absolute 11 out of 10. I think I also gaslit myself because I, I think I did remember it being much longer when I saw it in theaters, but mm-hmm. I agree with you. It is one of the best scenes in the movie, if not in like this entire franchise, like culminating in that moment after all of the weird ways we got to that point is just, it's, it's beautiful. Such a, such a profound moment. Honestly, one of the defining moments for the X-Men universe for me, for me, I know everybody has different favorite moments. This is one that stands out to me as one of my favorites all time. Um, and of course the only person who could help Charles is Charles like that arrogant son of a gun he means well but damn that dude that dude is a little arrogant uh i really then magneto gets the helmet he pulls it through the glass first of all i would love to see a behind the scenes of how they shot that because that thing burst through the glass and i feel like they may have just launched that damn helmet forward Mm -hmm. and then cut the camera angle because they uh it probably fell out of his hand because he didn't actually catch it but i thought that was awesome how they did that and next to the helmet you see angel's wing havoc's suit and the coin that killed shaw all props from X Men First Class, which is a great movie that I've seen all the way through, and I think is great. Uh, I was I, I I wish they would have had something like the Wolverine costume or something there. One more, just because it still never made the cut. But you know, I'm a geek for an Easter egg. Uh, then you get to the, the dual action of the past and the present. I mean, you just it's hard to top that with Storm and Bishop and Blink and Magneto fighting on the front where they're trying to protect Kitty Pride and uh, Xavier and uh and 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 wolverine while they're doing their little mind meld into the past and then in the present or in the past you have everything going down in dc oh come on he moved a baseball stadium so good so much stealth product placement so much period (laughs) appropriate stealth product placement as well but it was really really dope and i'm like wow this is this is a massive flex to be like this is a game we're playing let me go ahead and drop that on y'all one time. He's so good. Like, I, I agree with... I, I really wish there was another movie with with the, the younger characters that is not Apocalypse. Because, goodness gracious. Mm. I had to put that last asterisk there. That is not <laughs> Apocalypse. That is something else before that allows for the stylization to make more sense. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, tremendous. I think we'll see them in Deadpool and Wolverine, most of them. I, I think so, too. I think so. Um, yeah, the boy, fingers crossed, Jamie. <laughs> James McAvoy <laughs> just dances into in the uh, <laughs> frame with his wig on, and that's it. <laughs> I mean, there's if if there's a moment, and if any character was going to say it, I just know, J- Aaron, do not sit next to Jamie during this movie because <laughs> there's a high probability that Deadpool's like, are you guys friends or are you going to kiss? And you know, Jamie's just going to do a backflip. You know, I'm going to sell, sell that punch like Dominic Mysterio. <laughs> Ooh, Wear a puffy that, jacket. <laughs> yeah. That was a shoot punch, Aaron. There was something behind that. I need to know what happened with Becky and Dom because she she put something behind that, but that's a podcast mm. for another time. Mm. Mm. But yeah, good luck. That You'll be bruised up after that one. This um, is me with a bag of peas during the review. <laughs> you turn the third act. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to you, Aaron? I watched Dead Bull and Wolverine with Jamie. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> She likes the movie too much. <laughs> well, she likes it too much. Um, <laughs> sent, or what else we got here? Wolverine. Okay, so we get. Let's just cut to the end here. Wolverine is the only person to remember everything. He's been left out there to drown, basically. After Magneto wrapped him in rebar, uh, the the throws him in the Potomac River, uh, leaves a baseball stadium out there on the lawn. Hate when that happens. <laughs> and we cut to the future where Wolverine now sees cyclops is alive who we haven't seen since x3 he knew he died then gene is alive and he's not supposed to be touching her face because cyclops is always like bro stop touching my girl even though she kind of wants you to touch her we think but like maybe she doesn't we're not really sure uh yeah a little blurred line there um mixed signals bro sometimes it's a dream so either way you can't act on dreams wolvie uh who everybody's there colossus and kitty pride are teaching a class kind of a reference to their comics history bobby and rogue are together uh, and Wolverine's the only person to remember it. And Charles is like, you remember. So just this just goes to show how Wolverine really is the character who is always carrying the pain with him. This guy just, he he's, he's the man, poor fella. The first time I saw this movie in theaters, this, this scene healed me mm-hmm. in a way that I had been broken since 2006. Mm-hmm. And it like this, because of this ending, it is, so much easier for me to watch The Last Stand now because it just like retconned The Last Stand. Well, not even retconned. It's just, it's a, it, you know, he changed the future. Mm-hmm. And so, and I didn't know that when, when Kelsey Grammer showed up, I, just, <laughs> I, I never expect it. They always get me with Kelsey Grammer. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite letterbox tag, tags is just, ha ha, why is Kelsey Grammer? And it, it's like, it's, I gosh darn it but like and rogue I just as much as I prefer the rogue cut uh the surprise of rogue the first time in the end was so great but ultimately it just yeah it makes it just erases all the bad stuff this scene and I love mm-hmm. that so much and uh part of me wishes that they would have just ended it there but uh you know they didn't so it kind of erases like almost everything right I mean, I, I would imagine that a lot of the same stuff happened, yeah, sure, uh, but right, a little right. differently. Like, I'm sure Wolverine came to the team in a similar way. But his, I mean, with Stryker taking him, I, I don't know if uh, Origins is the same. I don't know if he volunteered. It was like also he did Mystique anymore. who took him, really. Yeah. Uh, As right. Stryker. Which, okay, it doesn't totally make sense. But, like, yeah, it, no, uh, it does not, none of this makes sense. <laughs> So we don't want to think about it too hard, but I also want to point out the interesting, okay, so we are now in the MCU, like the multiverse, right? And because of these movies, we know that, uh, that the X, these X-Men movies are part of the MCU multiverse because we've seen Kelsey Grammer and, um, but my, what's interesting to me is that in different timelines in the multiverse, time travel is different. Uh, that that is wild to me uh, but it has to be the case because in Endgame we know that you get branch timelines and in and in Days of Future Past it's one set timeline that you can change and I think that is an interesting thing to think about now that we know they are set in the same greater multiverse yeah I think it's gonna be interesting that's that's a big reason why I'd like to explore more universes to see to establish that what you know to be true and logical in one universe can be completely thrown out the window and entirely different in another universe. And I kind of wish Dr. Strange, the multiverse of madness would have done that a bit more instead. It, got, it gave us like globs of paint and a dead Illuminati, but 
I just would like to see universes where there's more changes to the rules of existence than pizza being free or paid for. <laughs> and I think that this is a perfect example. We could see that sort of thing maybe become a factor in Deadpool and Wolverine. And that could take us into Secret Wars and show us, you know, depending what universe we're in, the choices you make to try to fight whatever we're fighting will depend on where you're doing it, where it's taking place, which will be really interesting. Because, yeah, it is different, very different time travel rules. And neither of them are perfect. No. But, uh, no. yeah. So then let's I, talk about the, oh, real quick, deleted scene. But that before Wolverine went back in time, there's a deleted scene where Wolverine kisses Storm and they clearly have this very strong connection that has been developed in the time between movies that we didn't see. I mean, they had a connection, but like not, it was never really romantic in the previous films. And that's, you know, that's true to the animated series at times. That's true. That's not, this isn't the first time that would have happened, but they cut it from the movie. But later in the movie, he sees Storm in the ex in the mansion. And he's like, he's like, like, you know, he storm like may, maybe they did kind of write that with a little romantic intention. But then he goes right over to Gene and he's like, my love. So <laughs> I don't know. Wolverine's been alive long enough to have multiple loves. I would have really disliked this if it had been in the movie originally. But doing my an animated series rewatch, I hadn't seen that arc before. Mm. And I was obsessed with alternate timeline uh, Storm and Wolverine together. It's a it's a pairing I never would have thought. I would like, but watching it in the animated series, I was like, oh, I love them. And so now I'm like, now I want them to kiss in the live. <laughs> this has changed my perspective in such a big way. Now kiss. If you see, if you well, see the scene Halle exists, Berry in that you can scene. watch it on YouTube. It does exist. Um, but all right, who wants to guide us through the road cut? I know there's some strong. Can I just say before we get to the road cut, I do have one Easter egg that I really Please. want to point out. So uh, Chris Claremont and Len Wein, who are two comic writers who worked on the X-Men a lot, cameo as senators when Trask is meeting the tribunal um, and they both have speaking roles, which is really cool because there have been times where the whole right situation of how much creators get paid for being in movies. A lot of times the creators who have had actual scenes and have had actual dialogue get paid a lot more. So I'm really, really happy that they got their due for being in this movie. Yeah. That's like uh, Jim Starlin getting to be an endgame for a yeah. moment. It's, it's, it's just those moments we love to see. Um, good call. All right, Rogue Cut. What's the big differences? Well, uh, BD, you uh, you showed off your physical copy, and I have the correct physical copy. <laughs> uh, the the correct. one true copy. <laughs> That's fair. Hey, mine comes with fan art, though. Fair. I don't have that. Um I, I want to point out just I don't I don't know how you want to do this in terms of like well, the differences, but I I there's two moments that I particularly love so much that I hate that they're not in this movie. And one is when they're going to save Rogue and the Magneto uh, back to back or Magneto, the, the moment where he is getting his helmet versus getting Rogue. It's it's like the cool Magneto Magneto moment that we get with the Charles and Charles moment. And I'm sad that this movie doesn't have that. But I also have to say my favorite moment in the movie is when Kitty and Bobby kiss. And that is because we now know the, how gay that is. Because in the comics, Bobby is gay. And we now know that Kitty is played by a man. And so whenever I see that kiss, I'm like, yes, this is so gay. <laughs> and I didn't know it wasn't in the theatrical version. I was waiting the whole time for my gay kiss. And I was like, what? I am gypped from this moment. Not, not even just like, and of course, just all the rogue stuff I think is really good. Um, I get why they cut it. It's a long movie, but I think those are the, for me, those are the biggest changes that I wish were in the theatrical cut. It also just establishes Rogue and Kitty Pride or Rogue and Mystique as two of the most powerful and important mutants in the entire saga. And we don't really get that emphasis at all uh, in the theatrical cut. But yeah. how much longer is the Rogue cut? Look at this runtime. I think it's, I don't know. I think it's it might like be 10 the minutes. same. No, it's longer. It's definitely longer. Days of Future Past. I, I type in Days of Future Past runtime. It comes up as two hours, 31 minutes. And that's the one I just watched. Uh, uh, Rogue Cut runtime also says two hours and 31 minutes. That's wild. Oh, uh, uh, the Rogue Cut adds 17 minutes of extra scenes to the theatrical cut yeah. of the film. Oh, okay. That sounds that sounds well, correct. Someone okay. in the comments, do the math for us. Thank you. <laughs> Two hours and 48 minutes. Thank you, commenter, uh, who is 
coming from the future. All right. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. Anything else we want to talk about uh, uh, dissecting this movie? I feel like we've, we've, we've chopped it up pretty good here. Yeah. All right. Quick break. Then the road to Deadpool and Wolverine is going to give us our 10 score for X-Men Days of Future Past from Phase Zero. Share our show with a friend. Uh, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you in a moment. Welcome back to phase three of phase zero. This is the 10 score edition of X-Men Days of Future Past. Jamie Jurak, what do you got for X-Men DOFP? A rating, is that what we're doing? Rating out of oh. 10, if um, you will. So on Letterboxd, I gave it a four and a half. That would math out to a nine, but I'm going to bump that to a nine and a half. All right, you got a 9.5. Aaron Perrine. Uh, I'm going to go 9.5 as well. I really enjoyed this on rewatch probably more than I was anticipating. So yeah, Ooh. excellent. Jenna Anderson, how are you feeling? I'm going to weigh down the number ever so slightly. I'm going to give it a nine um, because I, to the point that I said, and we've said throughout the show, I do think that this would have benefited from having one other movie, either from the old team or the new team to really, really make this hit. But I do think there's so much of it that is really good. And the road cut is much better, even at like balancing the two rosters, but just purely the theatrical cut, it's a nine for me. All right. Well, no surprise. This is, this is hands down my favorite of the X-Men movies. So I'm giving this one a 10 out of 10. Uh, I just think it's such a good film. I think it's so engaging throughout. I don't know if it has sort of the same depth and themes. It, it really does, but they're, they, they kind of aren't as at the forefront as some of the previous X-Men movies, but I do think the characters come off tremendously, their dynamics, their powers, all of that. Uh, and the dual action sequences between the past and, and present slash future. Uh, and then the ending of it all kind of course correcting the X-Men saga. I think this is as good as I wanted it to be. It's 10 out of 10 for me, which brings us to a 9 plus a 9.5 plus a 9.5 plus a 10 divided by 4. And that is a 9.5 out of 10, making this tied for the highest rated X-Men movie so far, right? This is That's the highest we've had is a 9.5 on all the movies, right? What did we give X2? I don't remember. Shoot. I don't know. <laughs> I should, somebody should write this down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's a very good score. It's somewhere. Yeah. We gave First Class a 9.5 as well, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I believe that sounds right. Uh, I'll, I'll go back and double check. Maybe I'm just making stuff up. But uh, <laughs> X Men Days of Future Past, excellent X Men movie. Next week is Deadpool 1. I will not be on next week's podcast. I will be flying from Philadelphia to Las Vegas from WrestleMania to CinemaCon. So I'm going to miss it. I'm also going to miss the, the solar eclipse, which oh. here in Nashville is like a full on. I'm going to be on a plane, for the, which could be cool, hopefully. But uh, that seems like a cool thing. So spend your solar eclipse with the Phase Zero crew doing Deadpool. Well, I'm going to rewatch Deadpool. I might just be in the comment section if my airplane Wi-Fi allows me to. We're also going to have Jim Viscardi on the show this Wednesday because uh, we have some big news we have to share. And so Jim is going to be here on Phase Zero. Uh, if you've been a part of the Phase Zero community for uh, with us for a long time, highly recommend joining us for Wednesday's show. Uh, it's going to be a special one that you are not going to want to miss with Jim. So uh, see you there. Jenna, any last words for today's show? It's at Hey, it's Jenna Lynn on social media. As always, go read some comics. If you really like Days of Future Past, go read the Days of Future Past comic storyline. It's pretty well collected. There's a lot of different copies you can pick up. And it is as good, if not better, than the movie itself. 
nothing makes the comment section come to life like mentioning Jim. I'll tell you what. <laughs> uh, uh, Jamie Girac. Uh I want to say that uh, Brandon's sign off of show the, play the show for your mom has never been truer because my mom <laughs> texted me this week thinking that a video of Keanu Reeves' Ghost Rider was real. And she was so upset when I told her it was fake. And I was like, mom, if you want good marvel news i have a podcast for you so uh so if if your mothers are finding false information i think you gotta you gotta take bd's advice and tell them about phase zero uh, otherwise follow me on letterboxd we are a great show oh, for moms yes we're a great show. <laughs> put that in the bio or, or <laughs> leave us a five-star review and say i played this show for my mom and now she knows Yes. And now she knows. Um, Jamie, thank you. Aaron, what you got? <laughs> it's at some lake hoarded on Twitter. Um, I I don't really have that much to plug. Uh, my interview, second part with the Kevin Love Fund about the Spider Within, a Spider Verse story is coming, and we might have more for you on that front. Also, happy 10 year anniversary to Pluto TV, which <laughs> helped get me through the pandemic. They are potentially kind of our coworkers, but they do good stuff because if you need background noise while you're typing articles for Jim Viscardi, there's no easier place to just have Godzilla on a loop <laughs> than Pluto TV. All right, y'all, that's our show. Stay tuned to the social channels because things like this Gambit figure are going to be opened Ooh. up soon oh since God. we're in the X-Men era. Uh, if you're in Philadelphia or the area, you might be able to come see your boy doing the thing that's happening in Philadelphia this weekend. I don't know if I'm allowed to say more than that, but you know what I mean if you've been following, so I'm excited about that. If you're an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fan, I think all I can say is you really should be following Jamie Girac on social media. Uh, she's a huge Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fan, and for that reason alone, I highly recommend with a sense of urgency you go follow Jamie Girac on social media. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday for our regularly scheduled show with Jim. Please don't miss it. Uh, it's going to be a special one. We we have some big news to share. Uh, so come join that. And next Monday is Deadpool 1's review. So get, get a jump start on watching that again whenever you can. Leave us a five-star review on all major podcast platforms. We really appreciate it. Play our show for your mom. Play it for your dog. Subscribe to the channel. And we will see you on Wednesday. Bye, everyone.